camps and institutions. It's the disabled who describe those institutions as prisons and social services as those people in pink uniforms who come and go when they feel like it. But some of the disabled are fighting back, demanding equality and real independence. This is the story of one family's struggle and of a remarkable young man who asks only that we look beyond the wheelchair and the body that doesn't work. I'm Rick Hoyt. I have cerebral palsy. Being unable to move or speak doesn't make me any less of a human being. I have the same feelings as anyone else. I feel sadness, joy, hunger, love, compassion, and pain. Washington, D.C., the Marine Corps Marathon, and Rick Hoyt and his father, Dick, are running. Are you excited, Rick? Yeah, I'm more excited. Fire! To me, it's just that I have loaned him my arms and my legs, and it's him that's competing. Race directors didn't welcome the Hoyts at first. There is no category for a father and his crippled son. But after six years and some 250 races, it's difficult to exclude these two. Even with the wheelchair, they outrun 90% of the pack. I just think there's something that I build up in my system, adrenaline or whatever it is. Or maybe there's somebody up there helping us. But when I get behind a wheelchair and I start pushing, I, I can go faster. And Rick wants to win. I think this is something that he has put into me. Challenges are nothing new to the Hoyt family. They've been fighting an uphill battle from the beginning against Rick's disability and society's. When he was eight months old, we took him to a specialist pediatrician, and he was one of the most blunt, cold human beings I have ever experienced. I'll never, ever forget that day. He sat us down. He said, your son has cerebral palsy. He's a vegetable. You might as well put him away and forget about him. He's going to bring you nothing but grief. But he also said, this is what you have. This is what Rick is. Now it's up to you to take what you have and do the best with it. At that point, I says, well, we're going to bring Rick up just like any other baby. We'll gladly put him away for free, said the government, but there is no money available to raise him just like any other baby. So Dick Hoyt took on two jobs to pay for the wheelchairs and ramps and operations, and Judy took on the world, demanding that it accept her son. My kid was being cheated. He was being cheated of going to public school. He was being cheated of doing all of the things that he should be doing. Why did you want to put him in public school? Why not put him in a, a, a special school where there would be other kids like him and special facilities? Why was it important to you to put him in with so-called normal kids? Because we live in a real world. If you put him in a special school, that isn't the real world. That's separate. It was real, real important that the schools be forced, in my mind at that time, to let my kid in. In the end, they were forced. The state of Massachusetts adopted a special education law requiring public schools to teach disabled children. The federal government followed suit. And Judy Hoyt held bake sales to raise money for a communicator that would link Rick with the outside world. To speak, he taps out letters on a screen. It's what separates him from many others who are locked away somewhere because nobody's bothered to find out what's inside. What do you want people, Rick, to understand most about you and others who are disabled? Don't get... Don't get hung up. Don't get hung up on. Okay. Don't get hung up on the disability. You know, we talked to your dad a lot about uh, how you felt about running. In a word, how would you describe how you feel about running, what it gives you to be out there with your father? Mm. Great. Great? OK. Happiness? What do you think, Rick? Beautiful day to be out on a training run, huh? He's the one that started it all. He said, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like I'm not even handicapped. Rick has had a struggle all his life to go to school, 
to, to go and do almost everything. And he always wanted to be able to participate in sports. And I think this has come together where now he's able to compete. I mean, when you think back now on that doctor who said your son's a vegetable. I'd love mm -hmm. to say my vegetables at BU. Why don't you go and visit him? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rick, one of your... At 24, Rick Hoyt is the first non-speaking quadriplegic ever to attend Boston University. He lives on campus, 60 miles from his parents. He fought the state to pay for his education. He fought Medicaid to pay for his staff of personal care attendants, PCAs. He hires them and directs them himself. And through them, he is able to live life as he chooses. I'm not mad about it. Rick, I can't help noticing that your PCAs are extremely good looking and female. Mm. Which is more important to you, their skills or their looks? Be honest. Looks. But it's nice if they, they're skilled as well. <laughs> as long as they're not ugly. Mm. Ugly and skilled. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I thought so. This one. This one. It's real important to you to control yeah. your life. This one. Why? Why is it so important that you control your life? If I... If I gave up control... Mm. If I gave up control, I might as well be... If I gave up control, I might as well be dead. You really believe that? Even though I need help with everything, Rick says, I don't let my disability get in my way. So when the weekend rolls around, Rick has his personal care attendants roll him down to his favorite bar for drinks with his brothers and friends. How many people at this table does Rick Hoyt owe a drink? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. That's what I thought. So Rick, tell me the truth, though. During those marathons, you know, about 18 miles, 19 miles, do you fall asleep? <laughs> Really? Yeah, I'm on. He, he comes across the finish line like this. He's not, you know, waving to the crowd. He's stretching. He just won't. <laughs> Rick defends his basic right to get loaded on Saturday night like anyone else. My definition of independence, he says, is being capable of making my own decisions. I want to see him very much to be on his own. Judy and I are not going to be here for the rest of his life, you know. See, I could see some people turning to the two of you and saying, look... You're, you're setting up this kid for a real letdown. He's not going to find a job. It's next to impossible. It, how's he going to find a mate? Why, why didn't you let him go into a place where he'd be with other people like him, where, where he'd be protected, instead of giving him a taste of independence when he can <laughs> never fully enjoy it? I think we all want to be a productive human being. I think that's the basis of what we all want. And there are many, many ways to be that. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to walk and talk and get married and have six kids in order to do that. I think independence has many, many meanings for all of us. It doesn't matter who you are as long as... as long as you do what you... It doesn't matter who you are as long as you do what you set out to do. Pretty smart. 7 a.m. British Columbia, Canada. The start of a swimming, biking, and running race known as the Ironman Triathlon. Hundreds of athletes enter the water. Dick pulls his son behind him. A lot of people, you know, thought we were troublemakers. No, they're never gonna do it. They're never gonna succeed. They'll never finish. But they always do. As one disabled woman told me, control is critical in our lives because people so much want to take it away from us. The cycling leg of the triathlon will take 10 hours. Changing people's attitudes takes much longer. The disabled claim schools are still unnecessarily segregated. There are no national programs to help the disabled gain independence. People love to call Rick an inspiration and leave it at that. 
As dusk falls, the Hoyts complete the 112 miles, but a full marathon still lies ahead. Well past midnight, after nearly 18 hours of effort, father and son are only 100 yards from completing an astonishing feat of courage and love. From being involved with Rick from when he was small and growing up and everything that we had to go through, now I feel that there isn't anything we can't do. If you make up your mind to something, you can actually do it. Dick, what really kept you going? What kept me going, my son? 